views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. All right, welcome to today's verdict. I'm your trial attorney and host, David Lesh. We have so much to get to today. Three very interesting topics. New York City Housing Authority repairs and things that need to be made. There is help on the way. Stay with us. We'll let you know how. Number two, the MTA, subways. We got some problems coming up. There's not enough money, but Riders Alliance is going to be here to tell us how we could hopefully get through the pandemic and get the trains moving and staying on time. And finally, Robert Goldman, an attorney, will be here. Uh, he's going to discuss, you know, the issues that attorneys have and the stressfulness of it and different programs that they could use to help cope and get them through their work day. So stay tuned. We have much to get to. Stay tuned because today's verdict starts right now. Welcome our viewers. We are so happy to have with us uh, Stephanie Burgos Veras from the Writers Alliance New York. Stephanie, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> glad to be back. That's what I'm talking about. All right, listen, I'm a big fan of the subways. I'm on them all the time in, in Manhattan, in, mm. uh, back up to, the, up to my office in the Bronx. Um, certainly budget cuts is not something that makes me happy and I'm sure it doesn't make you happy uh, as well. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about what's been going on with, with the MTA uh, and what your organization is doing to try and counter it? You could. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure everyone has been hearing in the news that the MTA is deciding to eliminate up to 40% service as well as increase uh, the fares um, by 4% and also eliminate the monthly and weekly pass. Um, and all of those things combined sounds just like a catastrophe. And so since the beginning of the pandemic, just for a little bit more context so the viewers know, like, how did we get here? Why are we in this situation? At the beginning, you know, when, you know, we found out about this, this you know, pandemic and everyone had to stay home, the MTA saw their um, ridership decrease by more than half. Um, and so 40% of the MTA's budget comes from fares. And with that amount of people, you know, almost uh, four to six million people less every day, um, that really left a big budget hole. Um, and the thing is that before the pandemic started, the MTA was already experiencing a $3.4 billion deficit. And now, you know, uh, you know, just eight months later, nine months later, we're starting to see their deficit increase um, to almost over $10 billion. Um, and so right now they're scrambling because unfortunately the federal government, um, who is really the only one who can do something right now, has been unable to deliver a stimulus package that would give MTA the funds that it would need to provide service until the end of 2021. Um, right now they need at least $10 billion uh, able to provide service as it is until the end of next year but unfortunately congress has not come they you know they they come up with proposals they have another proposal and another and they can't agree on it and so time is running out and everybody has to make a decision by the end of the year um, on whether they're going to continue to provide service and in terms of what the riders alliance has been doing we have been advocating on the federal level calling on senator schumer calling on senator gillibrand on senator mcconnell and our uh our representatives to deliver $32 billion for public transportation. Because I'm going to read this quote, firing 9,000 workers and slashing 40% of subway and bus service would cost millions of New Yorkers several hours of commuting time each week and devastate the city for decades to come. Because when you think about it, Stephanie, if there aren't as many trains and they're not on time, well, what does that mean? People aren't getting to work. This is New York City. Not everybody has a car. Not everybody takes a bus or whatever these are buses do, but you, you, what's going to end up happening is you're going to really influence the workplace. Everybody suffers. Mm -hmm. um, am I correct? It's almost a cascading, you know, series of events. Absolutely. The way I like to see it is that the subway is like the veins of our of our bodies, right? And so you know when <laughs> when there's something that's not working, you're going to have problems. Um, without 
a good public transit transit system, you people can get to work. People will choose to live in different locations, um, and you'll just really start to see people decide. Like, do I really want to go there? Do I really want to go to the store? Do I really want to take this job because I'm gonna have to spend an additional 30 minutes? And the one thing that I like to re remind people is that time is some of, is is our most valuable asset. And so when you're taking people's time away, like that won't come back. Um, and so people will then have to make choices to protect their time. And I'm 100% sure that people don't want to spend an extra 30 to 40, 45 minutes on, the, on, um, on a train. And what might happen and what we've seen is that people are starting to turn to cars, which will then lead to more congestion. It will just lead to a more difficult city to get around. Well, how do you address those who say, all right, you want some more money, you want to put it back into the, into the system. But in the past, money has not been well spent, has been to, to put, you know, put a better word, mismanaged. It's not always, you know, used where we think it should be used. People always complain. The subways are always, you know, not on time. There's, you know, issues with, um, you know, with just the stations themselves. How do you address that? You know, you're looking, we're looking for more money from the federal government, but how do we know it's going to be put where it's supposed to be put? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's a great question that we've also been um, grappling with. And, and I think it's really, you know, up to the governor, right? The governor controls the MTA, the governor appoints the board. I mean, the chairman, he also appoints the majority of the board. And so really, I think it's important to hold the governor accountable to ensure that the MTA is spending this money correctly. Um, and, you know, sometimes when you think of like the MTA, it's like a massive agency without a face. And so for us, it's like, it is up to the governor um, to make sure that this money is well spent and really up to the advocates and really up to riders to be there as, as um, uh, to be holding the, the system accountable. And yes, the MTA is not perfect and I'm not here to say that, uh, but this is why, <laughs> this is why we're here. This is why we exist because for very, very long, no one was holding the agency accountable. And this you is why are. Right. And we are. That's what exactly. Does, which exactly. is something that, that the viewers should really understand. All right, so where do you think we're going here? You got a federal government that's, that's really just every day in the news, you know, they just can't seem to come up with the stimulus that we need. You know, there's infighting, you know, unemployment is, 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 is ratcheting it up. People who, are, who don't have jobs can't seem to find new ones. You know, they've been, those who weren't furloughed, some of them were just let go. There's no money that's coming, at least not, not tomorrow. What are your hopes? Do you think there's going to be some type of resolution in the next couple of weeks, hopefully before the year? What do you think? Well, I think right now the Senate and the House of Representatives are in Congress and they are negotiating a bill um, and they're working hard to, you know, potentially agree to something. Um, and we know that, you know, in the next year, the 2021 um, administration, we know that the new federal administration is more pro-transit. Um, and, you know, President-elect Biden has already mentioned his wanting to, um, uh, like want a stimulus bill. And I think the other thing too is that the Georgia runoff race is happening in January and that will determine on who will control the Senate. And which will. Will. that's a big race. That's, that's, gonna that's going to decide a lot in terms of monies that go into a lot of different people. So um, final thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Any tips? Someone's watching right now. They're a, they're a writer. They're not happy. Things are going to get worse. What do you have to tell them? Well, I think the one thing is turn your frustration into action. And the way that you can do that is by texting riders, R-I-D-E-R-S, to 52886. This way, your frustration, your experience is important. Please join our organization and be part of this movement holding the MTA accountable. And if you're someone who loves to go on Twitter, make sure that you're always tagging Governor Cuomo and that you're always, anytime you're frustrated, contact the governor because he is the one who is responsible. And I hope that you can text us and join our, our movement. Stephanie Burgos Veras, all good stuff, doing the right thing, organizing manager, Writers Alliance, New York. Stephanie, you'll come back on, right? Absolutely. If you invite me, I'll be here. Of course. See, of course. I told you what. Thank okay, you. stay with us, stay with us. We have so much coming up. Today's verdict, we'll be back after this. We have a really important guest today. Uh, Jonathan Gavile is here. He's the uh, vice president, uh, the executive vice president of a real estate department at the New York City Housing Authority. Uh, first of all, Jonathan, thanks very much for being here uh, during these uh, troubling times. 
Um, the buildings themselves, the NYCHA buildings, have long needed some type of help. Tell the viewers what's coming their way now uh, with respect to some relief. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to discuss this program. So we're really excited about the PACT program because as you mentioned, the buildings across our portfolio have uh, not received the types of capital upgrades that they've needed for many years. And this is the result of many, many years of insufficient federal funding. So we now have a federal program that allows us to leverage uh, ongoing HUD subsidy and bring in uh, private sector partners to help us make the needed repairs and to provide ongoing uh, property management once the repairs are complete. So the program is going to allow us to um, provide comprehensive and extensive repairs to all of the buildings uh, in this latest request for expressions of interest that we released a couple of weeks ago. And what you're going to see is full on uh, in apartment repairs. So new kitchens, new bathrooms, new finishes, but also building systems, common areas, roofs, elevators, security, uh, exterior shared spaces and park spaces, the whole building, all of the development will be comprehensively repaired. You know, it just reminds me uh, of what went on in the 70s with respect to uh, certainly the Bronx buildings that were burned out and the private um, community that came in and bought the buildings and repaired them and, and upgraded them and really built the Bronx and some of the other, other boroughs back up again. Um, why now? Why did the federal government finally seem to suggest that it's time to upgrade the buildings and provide a better quality of life for those who's living in the NYCHA buildings? Well, I think it's an obligation, right? I mean, we have to, we can't allow folks to live in buildings that are deteriorating um, ever. And certainly it's been going on for too long. And, you know, there's always a challenge of priorities and how to uh, provide enough funding for all of the needs, not just in this city, but across the country. So a number of years ago, uh, this program actually dates back to the Obama era. So they had come up with a program that allows you to leverage existing um, fin uh, federal funding uh, through this program called RAD, which is the Rental Assistance Demonstration Project um, program. And that, would, that allows you to unlock some of this uh, federal funding. So from the federal perspective, they are not actually increasing the funding to NYCHA or to the developments. But what it does allow us to do is bond against uh, this stream of income that we have been getting for decades and decades. But now it allows us to uh, issue bonds and make the repairs up front uh, in, the, in the coming years. Well, Jonathan, who goes first, I guess? What buildings get priority? Um, what neighborhoods maybe get priority? How do you pick and choose? You can't do them all at one time, uh, unless you can. That's right. So we've actually, this RFEI that we just released is actually called Round Nine. And so as the name implies, we've actually done a number of deals. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we just closed um, our Manhattan bundle, which is another 1,700 units. So we've actually done a few of these transactions and we've, we've gotten through about 9,000, uh, almost 10,000 units uh, so far. Uh, so we've got some progress, but as you know, we have um, 175,000 units within our portfolio. So there's, there's a lot to do still and there's a lot of need out there. But in terms of how we decide what is uh, you know, the priority, it's really a look at a couple of things. But first and foremost, it is looking at the entire portfolio and really ascertaining which ones are in the most dire need of repairs. Um, obviously our buildings, you know, there, there's some that you see in the news a lot with specific problems and they get a lot of attention, um, but there are some that are in fairly good condition. And so those are, you know, they would come later in the pipeline, but we're really looking at the ones that are the most challenged to make sure that we address the needs as quickly as possible. You know, and when you say challenged, are, are those the individual units that are challenged? Is it the lobby that where the security system, the cameras, where do you see as the biggest need with respect? I know, I know you could say, well, it's bathrooms, it's the windows, it's, it's, it's everything. But, you know, Jonathan, what seems to be the, the number one priority with respect to these buildings in terms of upgrading? I mean, there's, it, every development is different and has a mix of different issues. Uh, we've got problems with leaks and mold and lead um, and systems that no longer work, elevators that break down, heating systems that break down. So those are just the general types of issues. Um, but each building uh, and each development has, uh, you know, those, those problems tend to emerge in different ways. So in some buildings, it may be 
you know, a bigger problem with roofs. And so there's a major problem with right. leakage and this sort of thing. Right. Other buildings may have problems with heating. So it's not as if, right, but know, the leaking, it's, you know, it's like the leaking roof leads to the falling ceiling, which leads exactly. to the mold, which leads to the health issues, which exactly. it's, it always things spiral around. Um, and that's why, that's why what's important about this program is that it's a comprehensive set of repairs, right? We are not just going in and fixing the bathrooms and saying, okay, the mold or the leaks that are in the bathroom are now fixed. We are actually going to fix the roofs, the exteriors, the windows, the wall, right. you know, the facades to make sure that the buildings are secure and that you're not going to have the kind of leakages and the moisture problems anymore that would then lead to more molds. So it's not just treating the symptoms of the problem, it's getting to the core of the problem. Well, you know, someone watching is going to say, oh, that's all well and good. That's wonderful. But I don't want my rent to go up. Please, I can't, I can't afford it. Um, coronavirus, I, when I'm not working. What's going on with that? There is no problem on that front. Uh, no it is important. Absolutely not. It is, you know, the actual name that we've given to this program is called PACT, which stands for Permanent Affordability Commitment Together. And the reason we've branded it as such is because we want to communicate to people uh, that in no way will the rent go up as a result of this work. Um, the same framework and the same protections that residents have as NYCHA residents, whether it be in terms of their rent and their share of their income that they pay towards rent and other types of uh, tenant protections around succession rights, et cetera, those get carried over in these transactions. And so, you know, the vast majority of NYCHA residents pay no more than 30% of their income on rent, and that will be the same post-conversion. So once we've gone through this process, once the apartments have been renovated, and they are now benefiting from new day-to-day uh, -day management, their rent will not increase. They will be capped at 30% of income. All right, uh, let's, let's end off with a few tips. So somebody watching right now, living in a NYCHA building, heat, hot water hasn't been there. Mold, unfortunately, has been. Bed bugs has been broken elevator um, steps that are cracked no security camera uh, they try and get into the building the locks broken some tips tell them what's coming tell them what they can do to prepare themselves for the for a better better quality of life well look one of the cornerstones of the PAC program is that we want to have resident involvement um, when we you know, go through our portfolio planning process and we identify buildings as having significant need, we don't just show up and uh, with a new development team and start the renovations. There's actually a comprehensive education uh, uh, program that we roll out. We go out, we do a lot of engagement with the tenant association presidents and then to the larger group. Obviously in the COVID days, a lot of this is a little bit challenged and it has to be done remotely, but we are focused on really making sure that people understand. And every time we do one of these projects, we enhance the education program that we roll out. So I think for, pro for folks who are going to see um, the next round of renovations, we're going to be doing a much more comprehensive education program than we've ever done. And we're going to walk through each step of the process. We're going to talk about what PACT means. We're going to talk about the resident protections. We're going to talk about the renovations. And during each of those sessions, um, residents will be invited to share their input. You know, we want them to tell us, like we know, you know, at a high level where some of the problems are, right? Because we've done engineering studies of the buildings. We know that the elevators don't work, et cetera. But people live there every day, right? They know where there's very specific problems because they live it and they breathe it every single day. We want them to tell us. And I can tell you that in prior um, projects, we've had residents tell us about specific security issues or specific you know, issues with the outdoor spaces. And we have incorporated the input from residents into the development. So I think the best thing that people can do, I know there's a lot of uh, fear and concern about what it means. People think that when we talk about bringing in private sector folks, that their rent is gonna go up and they'll be displaced. Don't be afraid. I think the way to do this and be successful is to engage with us. We are open to working with you and, um, and, and really incorporating resident feedback. Jonathan, thank you so much. Good stuff. Good good stuff for everybody, to be honest with you. It's a long time coming. Um, hopefully you'll come back and let us know how uh, the construction and the repairs are going in the next couple of months. What do you think? Will do. Thanks so much. All right, you hang with us. We'll be back with more Today's Verdict. Stay with us right after this. Attorneys 
you know, we, we, we have a very stressful life, I have to tell you. Um, and my next guest, who is not only a personal friend, um, also an attorney, um, is there to help other attorneys who are going through a difficult time. Uh, Robert Goldman, I've known him for a good portion of my life, and he's been on the show before. Robert, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me, Sadeem. Well, Thanks. as I just mentioned, uh, it's not the easiest life sometimes to be practicing law. I come from a family of attorneys. I know what it can be like. Um, tell me presently what the work environment has been like for those in our profession and why it's so important in terms of, you know, maintaining a, a resilience um, during these troubling times. So the way I really became aware that lawyers were really struggling, Dave, is on Facebook, you know, lawyers for the first time in the wake of COVID, uh, people, we weren't prepared. And they were talking about their anxiety, their depression. You know, lawyers like to really have control of the situation. And myself, being an attorney and a psychologist, I could relate. And when I was seeing all my colleagues talking for the first time and coming forward and saying, I'm really anxious, I'm really depressed, um, they don't, you know, lawyers don't like to admit that. So I felt as a call to action to really try to help and educate them about resiliency. And what I've discovered is that lawyers struggling right now in the wake of COVID-19 is having to deal with the unknown. And lawyers like to, don't, we all don't like to deal with the unknown. And we also don't like lack of control. And in this situation, we really had to let go of all the court cases that we expected to have to show up live you know, what was going on with our cases, dealing with clients who were emotional themselves, basically the world stopped. And lawyers really initially were having a real difficult time. And I think a lot of them are still struggling with, you know, with the court system. How are things going? Are they appearing virtually? Learning the whole system because it's really, there's been a big shift in now the way law is being practiced. And Again, it's this unknown area that has caused a lot of anxiety. I mean, there's, there's job dissatisfaction, there's absenteeism, there's, you know, job turnover, um, so many different, you know, stress-related um, issues that come as a result of that, yet you're putting forth, or at least you, you're creating a program for those in our profession to help cope. Can you tell the viewers about it? Sure. So it kind of just created itself organically. When I reached out and I heard all the lawyers complaining about how they were feeling, I'm like, they're finally admitting it. They're finally coming forward. Because back in the day, I used to go to the Bar Association and offer my services uh, on a monthly basis just to offer these group supports and only one would show. Now people were coming out of the woodworks um, because it was less stigmatizing. You know, we talk about substance abuse, uh, alcohol abuse when it comes to the services at the Bar Association, but nobody talks about anxiety and depression. So when I, this became a real easy soft sell because it's less stigmatizing to talk about resiliency. Um, and I started just building out curriculum based on evidence-based research, which shows how do we be more resilient? You know, the word resiliency has been the catchphrase. Everyone's talking about, we need to be more resilient. We need to be more resilient. But well, what does that really mean? So what I started doing was, first it started at three times a week because lawyers had so much time, they needed to keep busy and they needed to feel like they were being productive. And they had the free time because they didn't have to worry about going to court. So three times a week, I would build out curriculum um, and just discuss things like optimism, things like cognitive distortions, such as the imposter syndrome and all the things that the pitfalls that lawyers fall into in the practice of law. And I would offer them a support group, talk about it amongst their colleagues. And then it became clear from my partner who's involved in healthcare, she said to me, I think this is too small. And I think you have to reach out to other, other providers such as doctors, um, healthcare, schools, government, or everyone who's really struggling right now, but more importantly, building resiliency so the next time we're prepared, because we were not prepared for COVID-19 from an emotional level, and also 
obviously a medical perspective. Now you customize this program, am I correct? I mean, it's not a one size fits all. Correct. Um, you know? Yeah, so we, we have a staff at Virtual Resiliency where we want to fit exactly the curriculum to what the need is. So we're, we're starting with doctors and what, what the struggles they are faced with is different than what lawyers are faced with in all areas. So it's a business to business. We go into the business, say a law firm, say a bar association, and we offer these services in a group cohort manner. So there's support. It's not just a one-on-one -on -one type of thing and it's not therapy per se. It's a supportive environment where it's customized to meet the needs of each of those companies or professionals. And just so the, um, the viewers see, you can, you can get this information at info at virtualresiliency.com. Phone number is 332-206-5211. This particular statistic is, is mind blowing here. 28% of attorneys are struggling with depression, 19% with anxiety, 23% struggling with some level of stress. I mean, you're talking about you know, large numbers of people, and these are just the ones that you know, that are, that are, are willing to admit it. I mean, they're right. coming home, you know, they're, there's just, it, it impacts on their family, it impacts on their children, it impacts on their parents. The program is, just seems so important. Does it seem to you at this point, because of the coronavirus and because of the pandemic, that more, are going, more individuals are gonna be looking to this type of work and help more forthcoming, really? Dave, I think that's an excellent question. And I think that's what we're trying to say is that this is not a crisis program, that there's gonna be a lot of trauma and a lot of life lessons learned after this is over, right? So we can't just bury our heads in the sand and wait for another crisis to occur. We as professionals, lawyers most importantly, have to understand our weak spot, weak parts, so that when we go back to practicing law, and I use that in quotes, we're better prepared for the next crisis to occur so that it isn't a crisis. So absolutely, I think that, you know, I think in post COVID days, this will be more important than anything. Otherwise, all the struggles that we went through, Dave, would not be worth it. Nope, would not be. Robert, you're doing a, um, you're doing a, uh, a service to the community. It's very, very important. Listen, I come from a family of lawyers. I get it. It's a very stressful job. Um, I think everybody should get on board this uh, virtual uh, um, resiliency program, TLC. Um, Robert, good luck um, okay. with the program. I think it's going to be great. Um, stay healthy, and you're going to come back and tell us how it's going, aren't you? Absolutely, and stay resilient. All right, well, that's all we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us, and of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you have any questions or any issues that you'd like me to discuss, please email me at davidlash at bronxit.org. Well, until we see you again, always remember, know your issues, know the verdict. We'll see you next time.